Welcome to Pivotal Moments Media. My name is J.B. Spiso. Some of you know me as the Sergeant Major, Army Ranger, retired Army Sergeant Major, and glad to be a part of our wonderful platform. And today, our guest is none other than Navy SEAL, Mark Green. Uh, Mark, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story. But before that, I just want to say uh, I'm interested to hear this because everybody that joins the military has a story how they get there, uh, yeah. which which I which I love. Like for me, I tell about how I, you know, wanted to pay for my own college. You know, my parents were hardworking middle class people from Pittsburgh, and I wanted to pay for my own college, and I ended up in the you know, army rangers having no idea what I was getting into. Um, uh, a good friend of mine uh, who was a dr drill instructor with me when I was in the army, um, you know, he was an inner city kid and he got in a little bit of trouble. But because he was a good athlete, the football coach talked to the judge and instead of going to jail, he went to the army <laughs> and ended up having a great career. So I think it's so interesting how people choose a different um, path to get to the military and, and, and their branch of service. So Mark, welcome. Uh, I'm excited to hear your story. All right. So like you said, I was a, a Navy SEAL for 20 years, started off enlisted, uh, ended up as an officer. And um, my story, like so many other stories, I was doing something else <clears throat> that I was passionate about, which was uh, playing football, played football since I was nine. Um, and third generation uh, military. My grandfather was in the army, served in um, Korea. My father was in the Air Force, um, and was in the Vietnam era, and retired in '88. And it was always in the back of my mind. But you know, we were poor, pretty poor kid growing up in Ohio, and I was going to work at the post office after high school, and uh, you know, have a pension and be pretty happy. But you know, my dad pushed to do this, to do athletics. So ended up going to college at Miami of Ohio, um, played quarterback there, and then transferred up to Kent State and had a shoulder injury that just ruined my career on the spot. And a buddy of mine talked about, uh, he's like, hey, bro, don't worry about it. We're going to go be Navy SEALs. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I love um, it. Brian leading the blind. He didn't know what seals were. I didn't know what seals were, but there was this video. Uh, I think it was called um, be someone special. Okay. And it was just a light switch that turned on. I was like, what in the world is this man? You know, my mom had always told me that I was going to be something special one day. So I saw the video and I was just like, okay, this is it. This is it. Football career is over. Um, <clears throat> but I was going through the motions. I was, I wanted to finish what I started. So I transferred back to Miami of Ohio because that's where my friends were and mm -hmm. it was closer to home. And um, at the time, it just wasn't for me. I, I, I didn't have any drive, didn't have any motivation. I was in college just to be there. And so I plunked out of college and I uh, was mm -hmm. working at a, a video store. You, I'm, you know, Blockbuster Video. Yeah, and, back in the uh, day, for sure. Yeah, yep. And a buddy of mine walked in and <clears throat> saw me in my uniform. I was like, what are you doing? Working a blockbuster. You were supposed to be not this guy. You know, you were supposed to be doing something else. Right. And I didn't have a good answer for him. And um, so working a blockbuster and, you know, not a career. And then one day some guy walks in <clears throat> and he utmost confidence walked in and said hey man i'm looking for this movie it's about this girl who turns into an alien and starts eating people and you know i can't think of the name of it and you know does the, the double triple you know flinching of his nose is like yeah you know that movie speckies and in utter disgust i said sir do you mean species and he's like yeah yeah species and i was like i've had it i've had enough so I joined the Navy the next day. Love it. Went down to MEPS and said, hey, look, I, I'm at a, I was 24. So I was like, if I'm going to do the SEAL thing, it's got to be like right now. And I joined the Navy on July 19th of 96 and was in boot camp. And um, that was my origin story, passed my test and 
joined in July and January 2nd, I was at uh, the Naval Special Warfare Center in Coronado and was not at all prepared for what I was getting ready to get into. But um, so, yeah, so that's that's where it all started. Um, I, I and, love that. I love that, Mark, because you there was a defining moment mm -hmm. in your life, a defining moment. And you're like, I am not going to be here. That's it. And, you know, you made that decision for yourself. And we talk about, you know, a lot of times I know you talk about it as well, too. And we do in pivotal moments like you make a decision um, and 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 that decision has to be you, whether your buddies tell you or your parents tell you or yeah. your girlfriend tells you or whatever. But you make that decision to make it. And you did. Um, I love the fact that, you know, you showed up, you know, show up to buds. You're like, you're, you're like, what the hell did I get into? Um, yeah. I, you know, when I showed up to back then, it was called Ranger Indoctrination Program, RIP. Now it's called, you know, Ranger Assessment Selection Program. But, uh, you know, way before the Internet, I had no idea what I was getting into, mm -hmm. you know, like you both, you know, middle class kids from a part of the country, you know, Pittsburgh and Ohio there. Right, so, yeah. it, you know, there's a lot of similarities. And um, uh, I'll, I'll let you tell your story, but uh, uh, it's probably similar to mine where you know, the senior instructor came out. So there was 133 of us standing there. And his senior instructors came out on this like porch of this like tack building. And he was like, I don't care if any of you make it. And, you know, and, the, and it started right there. You know, the beatings began as they want to say, you know, with the you know, low crawl, high crawl, that's it. And see how many people they can weed out the first hour. So why don't you tell us about, because, you know, there's so many stories out there about buds and ringing the bell and, and 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 all that and they're just trying to figure out um yeah who has the who has the heart who has the will i guess right what, what, yeah. what are your thoughts so um we show up first day and you're dressing in uniform and they put you in front of what's called the pit and so there's bleachers in the shade and you're right in front of medical so all you see all day are these horrific injuries coming out some guy you know shattered something or torn something but the one guy who stopped was he had fallen off of the 40 foot high obstacle, landed feet first, popped both his hips out of socket. And I was just like, what happened to you? And he told me the story. So he walks off and this um, chief walks in, walks over and I'm already Jack Cameron. And he looks at me and he's like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I was like, well, you know, I'm a little chilly instructor. He's like, don't even unpack. And he just took off. So that was my first introduction. Mm -hmm. But um, so a couple of days later, we were in our dress blue or we're in our uniform. So we're starting buds, right? And um, I'm excited. And uh, like, hey, Green, it's your first day. Go get wet. So you have to take a swim buddy. You do everything in pairs. So swim buddy comes along and we go into the water and it's sunny out, but I didn't research San Diego. I thought it was, if it's sunny out, the water's warm. No, no, so, no. <laughs> Pacific in January. I found out quickly, so I jump in the water, and takes my breath away. Right, pins and needles, and I was like, I've never been this cold in my life. And, I, and that was the first day. The guy next to me said, "Hey, Mark, you take care of yourself. I hope you make it. Quit on the spot. On the spot. Yeah. Didn't even give it a chance. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I quickly realized that you really can't prepare." for buds, rip, anything you're anything mm -hmm. specialized. You really can't prepare for it. You can get in a, some level of shape, but you learn quickly that you are not ready for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found out is that just like your drill instructor, you the instructors want you to pass if you want to be there. Mm -hmm. They'll facilitate you passing 100% of the time, but they will also facilitate you going away if you if you don't want to be there, if you don't, you don't make the cut. And there was an instructor, Corey, who was having an aneurysm. I thought, you know, veins were popping and stuff. He was just yelling at the class and I was struggling with my swims. So I had to make a decision. Like, do I let this intimidate me and, and struggle through the swim? Or do I walk up to this instructor in, in the height of having a fit and say, Hey, I need help. So I chose the latter and said, hey, instructor, 
I need uh, to come in on Saturdays for some remedial swimming. No kidding, JB. Broke character. Looked at me and said, absolutely, man. Come in uh, Saturday, 8 o'clock. See you there. Mm -hmm. and, love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And love it. From then on, it, I just kept bugging the instructor staff to get me up to speed. And that's how I survived it, really. You know, part of it. yeah, that's that's exactly it. It's so funny. So because sometimes like, you know, in the military, like we just want to be like quiet and mm -hmm. and and some be in the shadows, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, at the uh, CrossFit gym that I go to, there's a young man that um, he's actually he joined the um, uh, the SEAL boat program. I don't mm -hmm. want to get the acronym wrong, but um, uh, and he was asking me, all, I said, I said, be in shape and try to like win every event. You don't have to worry mm -hmm. about being in the middle. If they know you're dedicated, they know you're fit. It's going to, it's going to go a little better for you. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I love what you did, Mark, is you asked for help. You went there. Um, I went to uh halo jump master school as an E five. Mm. I only had, I had the minimum jumps necessary to go i was like third or fourth on the list to go the order merit list and the top guy got hurt on a mission the next guy was in uh, a v knock or some type of leadership school the other guy couldn't go he got sick and all of a sudden they called me like the day before you're going to halo jump master and i'm like hang on a second time out here like this <laughs> is it and uh i remember like the first or second day in class and i was struggling and you know the instructor's like yeah, anybody can stay after class if they want and 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 learn. And you know, everybody else was you know going to the Green Beret Club and having yep, a few yep. beers. I stayed and cleaned up the classroom, and he like retaught me the class, huh. right? And I just started at, like every day I would show up. Every day I would show up for that extra help, and then I ended up you know being a first time going past everything. So I think it's so important that you're like you you realized you're like you know what I need a little bit. Mm -hmm. I asked. Uh, and then it and then it went from there. So continue on with that because I, I I just love the fact that here you are and you know you're 24. So while you're doing this, you know I think for me when I started, you know I was 18. I was just like so naive. I just wanted to just be there mm -hmm. and and not get cut that day. I think that was my biggest thing. I was I was so afraid of. I made a decision and I don't believe I was like that mentally tough then. I didn't understand what mental toughness is. And that, there's my question to you. I want to know, did, did you maybe at 24 understand it a bit more? I didn't understand men mental toughness at all, but I just understood, okay, I'm going to do everything in my power not to get cut today. You know, they can throw me out, but I'm not quitting. <laughs> right. So that's, yeah. that's going to be, and then I'm going to do everything I can so they can't throw me out. And then, that was my goal uh, as a as a young enlisted soldier, just like you were. Talk us through yours. So mine started with my my dad actually. Football started not when I was nine years old, and he sat me down and said, like, "Okay, here's what we do in the Green household. Once you start something, there is no quitting. You can't. You just can't do it. You you're gonna have to suck it up through the season. If but we don't quit around here." So when I showed up at Bud's, once I showed up there, quitting, that was off the table, right? So that's, that's one obstacle gone. And then slowly over time, I, after asking questions and bugging the instructors, how do I do push-ups better? How do I do pull-ups better? And finally, it was like, Green, just go away. Just, you're fine. And one day I had a heat injury and... um the instructors kind of get in trouble because they didn't give us enough water at the time. So with the instructor was like, okay, green, you're going to be hydrated inside and out every time I see you, which meant that when he saw me, I had to go get wet. And then I had to come in and drain my canteen. Like mm -hmm. you're going to be hydrated all day, every day. And there was a gentleman named senior chief mink, who was a damn net guy, legend, of, legend in the teams. And just, he, he, I noticed he just kept watching me, not, he, you know, never beat on us or anything, but he just kept watching. So after this heat injury, um, he's like, hey, Green, come on over here. 
He's like, look, he's like, look. I think you're gonna make it, but I think you need one more thing. And he's like, I have this thing of bullfrog, um, sunscreen. He's like, everybody I give this bullfrog to passes. And he, he looked around, he's like, there you go. But now you're gonna make it. Now get out of here. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. So I still had that thing of bullfrog. And it was just those little wins every day. Yeah. That like, hey, you want to be here. We want you to be part of the community. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing what you're doing. So then I was like, okay, so physically I could do it. Mentally, or I knew I wasn't going to quit. And then I just realized that they have to feed you every four hours. So whenever I, my stomach would start growling, I'm like, oh, something's getting ready to happen, like food. So whatever whatever we're suffering through right now is getting ready to stop because we get to mm -hmm. eat. So then it was a man. I broke it into chunks that I could manage. I didn't look at buds as the six month long, hundred eighty days of suffering. It was survive the day in four hour increments. So then, I it, quitting wasn't an option. Physically and mentally, I was there, and then I realized that I could break it into pieces that I could manage. So then, I'm just working out with my buddies in Coronado. Nothing easier than that. So I don't know if I was, if that's mental toughness or not, or if it's just figuring things out and understanding your body, understanding your limits and um, having a starting point. Because once I, I got that base really early on. So when an obstacle showed up at Buzz, be it even hell week, it was, okay, I can, I can do this for X amount of hours or whatever. And then before you know it, you're finishing first phase, or you're finishing Hell Week, and then you're finishing first phase, and then you're completing pool comps, and then you're going to third phase, and all of a sudden you're at the island, and all of a sudden you're graduating, right? And it was that same mentality that ask a lot of questions, bug the shit out of them because it's their job, and figure out a way to keep going. And one day, you know, you're going to struggle 180 days of anything. It's going to suck. And this kid named Jonas Kelsall, who was, uh, I think, a Blue Squadron guy, uh, 18 years old, and I was having a rough day. And he saw, he's like, hey, Mark, you all right? I was like, Jonas, I, we have a conditioning run, and I was like, I, I ain't going to make this one. And so he said, how about this? Run behind me the whole way, and I'm going to step and flatten the sand out just enough to where, you know, you're not putting out as much. So for four miles, I didn't look up once. I just looked at his feet and I just step after step. And he got me through that day. And, you know, we were just there. We were just teammates, right? That's really what it's all about. You're going to have a bad day. And when somebody else had a bad day, I did the same thing for that person. Mm -hmm. And it was just those little, like I said, those little victories every day that uh, kind of keep you going because your body's going to quit. One day you're just not going to feel it. Um body just going to be weak or mentally you're just not going to be there mm -hmm. and you look around and everyone is suffering but one guy is like i'm not suffering as much you know i got your pack i think that's a, that's such a great part about the military is that you know that you talk about that i love your bullfrog story sunscreen story yeah uh just you know that little bit of confidence that the, the guy gave you right there, like, you know, um, of like, you're going to be okay. I think it's so important that, you know, the military can look at, um, you know, our, our, our government, our businesses, they should just all look at the foundations of the military. You want to talk about, you know, bringing people together from all cultures, you know, rich, poor, black, white, green, blue, it doesn't matter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you put them together in situations that they just they just they just work together. They mold. They learn. Um, you, you know, barracks conversations, team rooms conversations. You know, one guy knows sports, one guy doesn't. One guy knows horses, one guy doesn't. One guy, you know, uh, you, you you sit around, you be like, man, my carburetor in my car is giving me problems. Next thing you know, somebody's at your car. You know, because the dad was a mechanic, the uncles were mechanics, and and it's fixed. And it was such this group of you know uh, of, of people that 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 come together 
that find a foundation for success. And you, you had this great 20 year career, you were enlisted, then went to OCS and became an officer, which is so amazing to do. And I, 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 I so tell young people to, you know, to do that. Yeah. If they have yeah. the opportunity to do that. And you did that. And then, you know, like for me, you know, the military stops and people always tell me, do you miss the military? And I always say, do I miss war combat? No, you know, we don't miss that. Right. And everything right. that, everything that comes with that, I said, but do I miss the guys? Do I miss, you know, the people that I've been around? Of course you continually miss them because again, it was this brotherhood and sisterhood that I think is missing now in our life. Um, and so maybe just talk a little bit about your transition and, and the challenges and, and all that. So the, the hardest thing about my transition was one day you're a Navy SEAL, you know, mm -hmm. and everything that goes along with that. And the next day, literally the next day, you're just Mark, mm -hmm. right? You go from cool guy to you're tolerated, but not welcome is how I, I came to realize. Like, That's really mission's great. still going. Mission's still yeah. going. Mm -hmm. It's nothing personal, but the military is designed to thrive in your presence and in your absence. And so once I realized that, I was like, man, what am I even good at? What am I good at? Because when you're in the teams, you're you're always getting challenged and you're always new guys. Somebody's always better. Somebody's always faster. Somebody's always stronger. So you walk through your career. It's like, man, I still suck at this. Right? Even though you're at an elite level, you're always getting challenged. You're always getting beaten at something. So you just never have that security of you being good. So, but you know, your teammates let you know how good or bad you are. Um, so, you know, you have that. And even though we complain a lot, it was just, Hey, you had this team room you had these guys who you're all on the same mission. You're all have the same focus. You may not all get along, but that is your tribe. And to have that tribe and then it'd be absent the very next day. You know, that's a, that's a soul crusher. And I got lucky because my transition took me out to Los Angeles to University of Southern California and you talk about a cult of people who love what they do out there and love being a student and this, that place. And I got there and all of a sudden I was in a tribe again. Um, and I was doing what I, I was learning a new job in a new city, but it was just the atmosphere. I was like, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to be okay because um, I have a new tribe again. And in the absence of that, I, I don't think it would have gone well at all. But um, that was really the best place for me to land uh, because um, the visible and invisible injuries are what really gets you. The visual, the visible stuff, if you're limping around or you've had surgeries, yeah, I get it. But when you cognitively can't perform anymore because when you're doing what you've done for 20 years, you're on autopilot. You know, you're not really learning anything. You're just muscle memory. You're perfecting your craft. Right. But when you're out of that environment, you're learning something new. That's when you're like, okay, I used to be able to, I used to be a lot faster at picking things up. Um, memory starts fading and you can't remember people's names. I mean, just the basic stuff you're starting to struggle with. So that is, that was the, the biggest challenge for me was understanding the, or I'm sorry, seeing the decline but not quite understanding what was happening to you. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really, that was really challenging and uh, almost, almost didn't make it through it. Well, I'm glad you did make it through it. I know that um, dealing with all of that, uh, I, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I listen to people and they they talk about, <clears throat> I um, listen to somebody ask this um, young soldier, like what, what he did in combat and he was like oh well you were like in a base or something and i like stepped in and i was like i was like listen combat changes everybody mm -hmm. i don't care if you're a gunfighter or you're you know you're a wheeled vehicle mechanic 
where you're you're dishing out chow, whatever it is. So then I put this guy kind of on the spot and he saw that I was getting a little edgy and he was like, oh no, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. I'm like, well, you know, that's the mentality sometimes of a of a of a group of people that don't understand it because they didn't mm -hmm. live it. They didn't live it. Right. And so I think that's uh where here pivotal moments we're trying to people to understand that it's okay not to be okay. Mm -hmm. And just because we're not okay doesn't mean we're not useful humans because we are. Right. Because because what do veterans bring to an organization? I don't care who gets the credit, number one. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, want, they want the organization to succeed, whether that's wins or making money or whatever it is. Um, they'll do more than what's expected. They'll thank themselves last. And they'll bring this, you know, honored courage teamwork because that's just been ingrained in them for the mm -hmm. entire, for their entire life. Yeah. And I think that's what I, when I speak to, um, you know, civilian companies, uh, um, that, that's what I continue to continue to say and continue to market because it's, it's, it's the truth. So Mark, your book, I love the title unsealed. I can't wait to, <clears throat> I can't wait to dive into it. Um, talk us about, talk us through your book, your thoughts behind writing it, how long you've been writing it and what was your outcome? So, I went to the Intrepid Center of Excellence, NICO, and that's where they kind of give you your, hey, here's here's your injuries and here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. And one day they said, and, you know, 22 veterans a day are taking their own lives. And I was like, wait a second, how many? Mm -hmm. So that's when the process started, 2015, right? And then... As I was going through my own struggles, I was I really thought to myself, because I didn't want to write a book, it, it goes against, you know, I'm going to get a lot of flack about, oh, another seal writing a book. Another seal but, writing a book. Yeah, yeah seal but, write a book. Right? Yeah, right. yeah. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, all those generations of people who got interested in special operations or military or something, they read a book, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, I was approached by Pivotal Moments to, to write the book. And I was really reluctant because I thought there were so many people with so many different stories. And um the gentleman said, write down all the transitions you've had in your life. And it's not, and obviously the, the military transition, but transitioning from being single to having a family to kids, to fucking out of college, leaving sports, um, professional, like athletes, you're going to be professional at something else. And I had these 20 things that were really significant transition points, some good, some bad, but the ones that were the most challenging could easily lead people to say, hey, I'm, uh, I think people would be better off if I'm just not around. And I wanted to say, okay, how about we take that option off of the table and provide a framework like, look, you're not going to have that locker room again, but you're you're valuable and you're 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 good at a lot of different things. And I really wanted to get at the problem and not um, the symptoms. And I thought for me the, to lay a, a foundation of, hey, we're all struggling through transitions. You're not by yourself. You're valuable. You have a network. You have a team. And I really just wanted to at least knock that number down by one. If, if we knock it down by one, you save a father, you save a mother, you save kids the anguish of losing somebody who didn't know you were suffering. And nobody said, hey, it's okay to suffer through this and um, use your network and use your skills that you have because I've, been, I've lost more friends to taking their own lives than to combat. And if we can reach, reach just one or two people and say, okay, I can, he's, he was at the, top of the, at the top of his game and struggled and made it through. And, you know, maybe I can too, because 
I was at the top of my game in athletics or I was at the top of my game in sales and somebody bought my company and I was an entrepreneur. And now what do I do? You know, um, you're valuable and your story's worth telling and um, the world is better with you in it. And um, that's really, the, that's really when it was presented to me in that way, then I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's do this thing because I really want to help because so many people helped me. And I had a really challenging time to where I asked that same question. I was like, I wasn't doing good at my new job. I was in a new city, LA, not friendly. If you're, if you're not in, in the right community, um, I was going through a divorce and I wasn't good at my job. And I was cognitively declining. And all those things kind of coalesced into one moment in time to where I said, you know what? I feel like I'm a burden and maybe it's just better if I'm not around. And I had this wonderful friend who I happened to, they happened to call right at that moment mm -hmm. and happened to have an, an, an attempt of their own. And they're like, I'll be there in 30 minutes. No questions asked. And I was like, look, I just, I know this is, I know this is going to pass, but I need some, I need some help right now. No questions asked, showed up, gave me a big old hug, took the weapons out of the house and said, you're just so you know, you're still valuable and you're loved by a lot of people. And just, do you need me to stay with you? I was like, no, I don't need you to stay with me. I just, need this i need to work through this a moment and have all the danger out of here and that was after that moment and after that intervention everything started to change at that moment you know because one i had four kids that still needed me um and i knew that i was slowly climbing my way out of my the toughest part of my transition and just that one person being there reminded me that, hey, you're valuable because you have kids and you have these people at USC who, you know, you're affecting positively. Um, you have brother and sister, and they just started listening to all the people who you're valuable to. Man, it's just like, okay, you're right. You're right. Still get the stuff out of the house. I need to work through this moment and then um then I'm gonna be fine. So that that's why I wrote the book is just to be that intervention that I got that really changed the tides. And then I just went on to just everything just went high and right. And it's been so rewarding ever since that moment. I can I know exactly when that moment was and um forever grateful for that. And uh it's worth getting grief from people who say, oh another seal, another book. But it's not a, hey, here's how great I am. It's a, no kidding, here's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's got vulnerability. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. But this is just, it's just what it is. You know, um, I wasn't great at everything when I transitioned. Um, but I was still valuable. And I, and I still had a lot to contribute. And, um, and that's really what I want to accomplish with this book. It sells one copy or a lot of copies. If it reaches the right people, uh, that's that's um, a worthwhile endeavor. And it's not really for, it's for veterans, but as you're transitioning, everybody goes through that transition. It's not just a service member, wife, kids, dog, uh, neighbors, everybody goes through this transition. So you're not isolated in this thing. And um if a spouse reads it or a child reads it and recognizes that, hey, my mom or dad might be going through something and this guy went through it and this story is exactly what I'm, what my parents are going through or my spouse is going through. Hey, mom, dad, brother, sister, read this because he was at, you know, worked at a really high level and need, needed some help. And this story resonated with me and I think it might be just what you need, just to just to start the conversation or kickstart, um, just a change in what you're doing, 
Um, it's not a remedy, you know, it's not going to solve all your problems, but maybe it's just that one thing that says, okay, I, 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 I get it. I understand this story about senior chief mink giving you the, um, bullfrog, you know, or when you lose your, when you lose a parent, because I lost a parent and, uh, it's just a realistic look at life and challenges that you face and you know, the resiliency you have. Um, you have it, you just might need to tap into it because you're sometimes doing things on your own and those, I do everything on my own muscles have atrophied almost completely because you're doing things as, as a swim pair or a team or a sales team or a football team. You're, you're so rarely doing something on your own that when you retire, you think you're by yourself. And those muscles, like I said, they're that muscle memory of doing it by yourself of atrophied. Mm -hmm. And they're they just need a kickstart. But even then, I I still haven't done anything since I was nine years old by myself. Nothing. And so just realize that um you're not in this by yourself. And you have support and you're valuable. I love it. Mark, that's a great story. I love it. I think that um, you're exactly right. If your book helps a neighbor, a service member, a young business professional, maybe lost his job or lost mm -hmm. her job and trying to find their way forward, the uh, Starbucks barista who's afraid to go to college, anything. Yeah. I think, I think books like yours, uh, they continue to, help people, help young men and women find their path. And then uh, a, a few things that I took out of your conversation today, you know, you're never too old to learn, which I love. That's one of my favorite lines. And so um, I think that uh, uh, I, I know when people listen to this, uh, they will continue to uh, find their path. Mark, I look forward to uh, speaking in person with you someday. I know we'll we'll be able to do that. I think you have a great story, uh, and we could come at folks in this nice little uh, Ranger Seal combination, which would be great. So, um, uh, yeah, I love it. So, Mark, I, that I think that's going to end end our call because okay. you are you are um, the way you ended it. I can't follow up with anything else. So, I would just like to thank the audience for joining us on Pivotal Moments Media for Navy Seal Mark Green. I am JB Spiso, and just remember, you can't control time, and there's never enough. All you can do is keep moving forward. Pick up Mark's book, Unsealed. You'll love it. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, you can pick up Mark Green's new book, Unsealed. It's flying off the shelves, so you can find it at his website, TheMarkGreen, that's G-R-E-E-N-E.com, TheMarkGreen.com, new book, Unsealed. Give it a try. Buy one for a neighbor. You never know, you might be helping somebody on their path to success.